Father, we just... <laughs> oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that the gift, of the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. We thank you, Father, for your kindness and goodness as we approach the throne of grace in the name of Jesus. We give you all the praise, give you all the glory. One of the things that I give you praise and glory about God is we don't come into this house to hear from a man or woman, ever do we do that. We come into the house to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that the Father would have us to be, and we'll give you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you so much. We're blessed as you bless us tonight with your presence and your word, healing us and touching us. We're just grateful people. Thank you, Lord, that tonight we can ask you also to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. Thank you for the Assemblies of God, the Foursquare Denomination. We thank you, Father, for Emmanuel Baptist Trinity, Ecclesia Church, God. We thank you for our Catholic brothers and Adventist brothers and sisters. We give you the praise, the glory, and all the honor. And Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, and we give you the praise because it's one kingdom we're building and it's yours, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. Tonight, as we go into the word of the Lord, I'm going to start a little series on Wednesday night that has really been tugging at my heart lately. I, I just keep saying to myself and talking to God about what we could be if we just believed God. What we could have done at the end of our life if we just started to believe God. How many changes could there be in your life? How happy could you be? How fulfilled could you possibly be? How blessed in every area, including finances, could you be? If you just got into a place of agreement about what God wants to do in your life. I heard this story from Dr. Gilfield uh, last week. It just rang my bell when I heard it. Now, I'll, I'll just tell the story to you, and I'll tell you the way that I heard it. And I want you to listen just for a moment or two about this story, because it could be you. This lady about 150 years ago in England was a servant in a very, very, very wealthy woman's house. She was a poor servant woman, young in her age. In her age. She took care of this elderly woman until the day of her demise when the woman died. And she was there faithfully taking care of her. She did everything that was needed for her, helped her to do everything that was necessary. And when the older woman died, the woman's family came in and sold this great estate off, which meant that she no longer had a job. 150 years ago in England, there was very few people that had jobs. Starvation was a big, big deal. And what had happened is that one of the relatives came up to this servant woman and said to her, this is a letter from my mom to you. The woman that was a servant didn't know how to read, never been able to read at all in her life, and had no idea what the letter said. So she asked the relative, what does it mean? What does the letter say? She says, I don't know. I haven't read it. But I think my mother is just telling you how grateful she was, and it was a thank you letter from your mother. The servant lady said, I'm so grateful for your mother, she's been a wonderful woman to me all of these many, many, many years and it was a privilege taking care of her. She took the letter, put it in an envelope and left. Sometime later on, unable to get an um, employment of any kind, uh, through years of poverty and years of sickness, she'd finally gotten old in a brink of starvation. 
Somewhere along the line, she found the letter. She took the letter, put it in a frame, and put it on the wall because she didn't have much other things that showed anything in her life that was any good. She put that letter on the wall in a frame, and then she proceeded to get old. Her teeth eventually were completely gone. There was no food. She was on the brink of starvation. She was elderly herself, and she was ready to die when someone came in to visit her to see what was going on. She went to the lady and asked her how her condition was. The lady told her she was ready to go. I think she was very sick also. All of her life, she had lived in poverty. And the lady started to read this letter on the wall. And as she started to read the letter on the wall, it was a thank you letter, just like the relative had said to her. But then the lady said, do you know what this letter says? The letter says that from her estate for the rest of your life, you are to get an income for the rest of your existence from her elder, this elderly woman that you took care of, and it was an estate. The woman got sicker in the next few weeks and passed on. Now listen to the, the thing that got me the most about the story is I wonder how many of us are like that elderly woman that just never read the letter. And that because she didn't read the letter and she didn't want to care about trying to find out what the letter said, just took it for granted in her life, lived a life of poverty. I wonder how many of us in here live less than the love letter that God writes to us in the word of the Lord. And that we just take it for granted. Because you see, this Bible is a love letter about the heartbeat of God for you and for me, what God wants to do and what God wants to see and what God wants to build inside of your life. And just like that elderly woman who died in poverty, oftentimes we'll miss all that God has for us because we never spend the time to read the letter that God gave us. And we live out our lives thinking that's good enough or it was okay and this is the way it is and we never go past where God has us to go. So I wanted to start a little series on Wednesday nights, if I may, for the next few weeks, called Accessing Your Divine Future. If you can't and don't access the divine future that God has for you, then whose future are you going to? And what kind of a future will you live in? What areas of your life will you remain in poverty or in bondage to the flesh? What areas in your life will you come up short and just settle for existence instead of the blessings that God has for you? Well, every one of us that are in here need to listen closely because this, whether you're in business or not in business, this is a message that says something. It's going to tell you that God has greater plans for you than you even think of. And the thing that stops you from going to those great plans is the fact that we never understand and read the letter. It's just like Deborah and I. I told Deborah and I, if you've been around this church for very long, when we first got married, I made this statement numerous times to her. I'd much rather go broke trying to do something for God than to have wealth and never do anything for the Lord. I said that numerous times in our life. I didn't know that I wouldn't go broke trying to work for God. I just assumed that that that's what happened, that's what happened. If that's the way it's going to be, that's the way it's going to be. What would have happened to us as a church if we just saw ourselves as a little church in a little pink rented building in Loma Linda with just a handful of people being able to get into the building and never saw that God had something greater for us? 
What would have ever happened if we took our ministry and we just stayed and said, you know, it's good enough to have a little pickup truck and go from house to house giving rice and beans away to 20 or 30 families a week instead of feeding the millions that are being fed right now here at the Rock Church on a yearly basis. What would have happened if we believed and said we don't have enough money uh, to take care of missionaries all over the world, but we'll just stay and keep the money here in the house and keep improving our own personal life lifestyle. But I want you to know something. We oftentimes in our own lives cut ourselves short from what God really has for us because we really don't read the love letter. And in the next few weeks, I want to zero in on the love letter. In order for you to understand accessing your divine future, you're going to have to understand some basic questions about who you are and who God is. If you can understand these basic questions, and we're going to go through three questions tonight that we're going to answer. And when you understand these three basic questions, here's the thing that's going to happen inside of you. You're now ready to take some steps forward in what God has for you. Can I just say this to everybody that's in here? Where you're at now, tonight, in this place is not where God wants you to end up. It is only the first and beginning steps of a future that God has for you. In every area of your life, I don't care how old you are, I don't care how young you are, it makes no difference because it's really not about you. It's really about a God can do anything. A God that is marvelous and a God that is wonderful. Question number one, who is with you? You've got to come to a place to realize that who is with you and what is with you is so important that what you carry into tomorrow, what you carry and who you carry into tomorrow with you on your adventure to a divine future, I'm here to tell you something, guys. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. is so important it'll stop you or it'll tear you down. And who is with you is a massive question. Sometimes who's with us is our own self. Sometimes who's with us is our own ideologies and philosophies or our family thinking, our people that we use as examples that never go anywhere, are never happy or never fulfilled and never do anything. And we take this with us all the time. We have images on the inside of people who we know that call themselves Christians that yet failed and yet we use them oftentimes as examples on how we can't make it. Who's with you is so important. Ever stopped and thought about dreams? One person said to me one time, I, you know, Pastor, I don't want to dream about anything anymore. I've been disappointed so many times. When you stop dreaming, you stop God. Because dreamers are the ones that have hope that there's a God going to come in and make something happen. And if you don't dream about what God has for you that's better than where you're at right now, then what you're really saying is, God, I don't believe that anything can really come to pass in my life. And I'm afraid it won't, so therefore I'll never take the step forward. Guys, we never should stop dreaming. We've got a God that's way beyond your thinking, way beyond your ability, way beyond your intelligence. A God who raises the dead, opens the blind eyes. A God who speaks and planets exist, that holds the sun at its right distance, its moon at its right axis so the oceans don't flood the land. And we put a limit on our God all the time. Who is with you? You've got to come to a place of realizing it's not just about you and who is with you. Who's with you is God. And God takes a nothing and a nobody and a, and a person that's uneducated and a person that can't make it in the world and a person that has no hope and gives them a dream and gives them a hope and gives them a power and gives them a strength that changes the world that they live in. Without it, man, we just fail. So who's with you? Is it you? Is it your friends? Is it your Society or social, who's with you? you got to come to a place and you got to settle in your heart that you don't need anybody but God. It's not about your education. It's not about how smart you are. 
Nowhere in the Bible does it say you've got to be smart, finish college. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to do anything like that. It's not about any of that. It's about who's all inside of you and how great he is. Without an understanding of that, you will always rely on your future based on what you can accomplish. Your future cannot be accomplished by who you are and your ability. It'll never be accomplished by that. It can only be accomplished by who is with you. And his name is Jesus Christ, day in and day out. Without it, my friends, we fail. Without an understanding of that, you will keep going back to yourself. You will keep going back to your bank account. You will keep going back to your sources. You'll keep going back to your intellect. You'll go, keep going back to gathering data and coming up with a conclusion based on the world's circumstances instead of looking at who is with you, who is with you is God. There's this incredible lady that sometimes we don't think very much of in Christian churches. Her name was Mary. An angel comes to Mary says, Mary, you're going to have a son. She says, logical question. She says to the angel, she says, wait, I don't know a man. He says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and overshadow you. Amazing statement. But what the Spirit says, the if you will, this angel says to her, was so fascinating in Luke, the first chapter. It ought to be the mantra for every single one of us that are in here. Go with me to Luke in the first chapter, in verse number 37. In verse 37, it says this. The angel speaking, for with God, nothing will be impossible. This is not about whether you have a personality or don't have a personality. This is not whether you're gifted with intellect or you're not gifted with intellect. This is not whether or not you can calculate, to come to a data and formula. This is about how much you believe the God that's impossible can do great things in your life. There is, with God, there's nothing that will be impossible. And if God is on your side, he is with you then that ought to be the heartbeat of every person in here. And may I say this to you, every person that's in here, I'm not talking to just some of you, I'm talking to every single one of you, every person that's in here, unless you get to the place that you know that God, who is a God of the impossible, he's a God that makes nothing something out of nothing. He's a God that takes all the formulas of this world and changes them. Two plus two to God is whatever he wants it to be. And until you come to that place, ooh, Life will shake you instead of you shaking life. And you need to be a life shaker, not life shaking you. Is anybody listening? In verse number 38, Mary said, and this is the part that I love about Mary. Behold the maid servant of the Lord. Look at me, angel. I'm the maid servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She got the letter. Is anybody listening? She got the letter. When you get the word of the Lord inside of you and you know that nothing's impossible to him that believes, my goodness sakes alive, that God Almighty is with you, you don't need anybody else. I told Debbie when I was young, I said, if you want me to be the president of the United States, I'll be the president of the United States. Have I ever said that to you, Debbie? I've said that to her a million times. Because it's not me, it's the God in me. I, well, she says, I don't want you to be the president of the United States, I just want you to be a pastor. I said, okay, I'll be a pastor. But because of God that's on the inside of us, how far can you go? What can you accomplish? What do you think that what you can't do today you couldn't do with God? See, that's the problem. Second question that we ask ourselves, and we should at least ask ourselves if we're going to have access to a divine future, is not only number one, who is with you, but number two question is what kind of commitment will it take 
there's going to be a commitment involved in this. I was loving Dan's message on Sunday. I heard it three times. How great it was when he got to Caleb. I like Caleb. Caleb's kind of my hero. He's 85 years old. And he still looks at this mountain and says, that mountain's mine. It's been promised to me 45 years ago by Moses. Give me the mountain. He's 85 years old. Most 85 years old say, give me the wheelchair. (laughs) This guy's ready to go fight. And by the way, can I just say something to you? He not only had to hold the promise for 45 years for it to come to pass, but when he said, go ahead and take the mountain, he had to fight for it. At 85, they didn't just hand it to him and say, here it is, it's yours. You better drive out all the enemy. This guy's 85 years old, ready to kick butt. Did I say kick butt in church? Well, I guess that's okay. I dress like this. You see, it's going to cost you something. If you're going to walk in the supernatural future that God has for you that nobody else could build but you, you're number one going to have to realize this is God that's going to make it come to pass and hold on to it for a long time until it does and work for it. That's the commitment. The working for it is that you've got to put yourself into this. It doesn't just happen. Nobody, and I've said it a million times, there's no angels flying over the magic wand. Tinkerbell doesn't fly through this building and put fairy dust on you. You've got to get in. What you sow, finish it, you reap. If you don't sow anything, you don't what? Reap anything. So many times we'll get to a place where people are discouraged with God. They didn't put anything in. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you you. In Matthew, the 19th chapter, interesting comments being said in Matthew, the 19th chapter. This is the the chapter, if you remember, where the rich man comes to Jesus and he says, sell all that you have and, and, um, and follow me. And the rich man had a lot, and he left, and he couldn't do it. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, you know, it's, just, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get in heaven. By the way, he's not talking about the needle, the sewing needle. A needle was the entrance into a village. It was difficult for a camel to do that, and it's not an impossibility. But then Jesus goes on, and he makes a statement. And we're talking about what kind of commitment will it take. And I love this statement. Let's hold it all together. Let's look at the verses together. And let's read this letter that God is writing to us so that we don't live our lives in poverty at the end of our life. And we get to heaven and God shows us a DVD of our lives that show us what we could have done, not just what we did. Wouldn't that be sad? In Matthew, the 19th chapter, starting in verse number 26, it says this, And Jesus looked at them and said, With men, all of this is impossible. Now, wait a minute. They said, how in the world are we going to get saved? Well, who gets saved? If you say it's as difficult for a rich man to get into heaven as a camel going through the eye of a needle, then who gets saved? And then God says this. He says, Jesus looked at his disciples and said to them, with men, this is impossible. In other words, you can't make it, salvation on your own. But with God... All things are what? Possible. But he doesn't stop right there in his thought about what's it going to take, what kind of commitment do you need to have in order for you to have a divine future. But listen to this, and I'm not talking about a future in heaven, I'm talking about here on earth. I know you're going to have a great future in heaven, but I'm talking about making it here on earth. I'm talking about being a witness to the people around you. When they're going down the tubes, you're getting better. When they're failing, you're successful. When they're broke, you've got it together and got it all together and and doing well. I'm talking about God wanting to bless you in every area. When you get into heaven, I'm not worried about your condition in heaven. We're not talking about that. That's great. We thank you, God, for that. That's the icing on the cake. I'm talking about while you're here on the planet. He says, with with man it's impossible, with God all things are possible. Verse number 27 comes along. Then Peter asked him and said to him, see... We have left all and followed you, therefore, what shall we have? In other words, Peter put it all in. He says, this is it. I'm going, I'm going for it all. We've left everything. We're following you. What do we have? Jesus comes along and he makes a great statement in verse number 28. And Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say unto you, 
that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you will have follow you that have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But verse number 29, I want you to catch. And everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, wives, children, lands, your own personality, your own thoughts, your own ideas, your own philosophies, your own wants. I put that in myself because that's what he's saying. <laughs> For my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold in eternal life. And in the Bible, one translation says receive a hundredfold in this lifetime, an eternal life. And then he goes on in the last verse, he says, but many who are first will be last and the last shall be first. The outcome of it all, man, you, you, you can't lose, but it's going to cost you everything. You know, when someone asked me one time, how do you pastor this church, you know, run, I, Debbie and I have a business and we do all kinds of stuff. We're always doing things. And uh, how do you find time to do all that? How do you pastor this church? Because it's not a mega church. It's a mega, 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 mega church. And um, so how, how do you, how do you pastor a church this size? It's simple. Number one, I know who's with me. And number two, it cost all. It cost all. Every bit. And I tell you what, I wouldn't change a moment of it. If you hear a grandpa standing in front of you, I got 11 grandchildren soon, any day I'll have 11. I have 10 now, but any moment another one's being born. And I want you to hear me as an old man older man, I want you to hear these words. God is faithful. And if you will deposit all of your heart in him and stay there and be faithful, he'll be faithful to you. And at your older age, the things you thought you could never accomplish, you will have accomplished in abundance. Are you following me? I promise you that. We're talking about accessing divine future. We're talking about answering some questions first in our own hearts. Who is with you? Number one. Number two is the question of what kind of commitment's gonna take, it's gonna take everything. You know, I like what Dan said about taking everything last week. Pastor Dan said, half-hearted commitments get half-hearted results. You remember that one? That just kind of went off on the inside. But here's question number three that you have to answer. I can't do this. You gotta answer it for yourself. Question number three, who backs us? You gotta come to a place that he's not only with you, but he backs you. We're talking about God. First Chronicles 29, 12. Put it up on the overhead. It says these words, both riches and honor come from you, speaking of God. And I love these words, both riches and honor come. Wait a minute. Someone one time said to me, well, you know, I really don't want to believe God for anything because I want to stay humble. Let me say something. You're not humble, you're stupid. There's a difference between humble and stupid. And what it is, is you're using that as a cop-out to not believe God for anything. And we need to be a people that understand it is the desire of God, both riches and honor come. Wait a minute, if they come from God, where do they go? They go to you. It is the desire of God to bring riches and honor to you. He's not a desiring you to be a nothing low lifer, to be a zero in the, on the scale of existence. He does, he's not going to say, wow, that person never believed me for anything, stayed humble because they were afraid to believe me for something. Let me tell you something. That's piety and it's, it is, it is disguised, but it's still impurity before God. And it's still pride before God. And what you're saying is you're afraid to believe God for something. I'd much rather believe God for something and, and do something for God than to say to myself, well, I'm, I don't have to try to do anything. I'll just stay broke and down and defeated so that I can, you know, never be tempted. Let me tell you something. If you're tempted by this world, could I suggest that you get saved? Because once you've met up with God, the world doesn't got a thing that you need. It's nothing. You don't give a flip about what the world's got to offer. You're in it, but not of it. 
And anybody who's going to come along and say, well, you never know. I'm just going to be pulled away by these material things. I want you to know something. If you can be pulled away by material things, then you're probably not even really safe. You just talk a good talk. And somebody needs to tell you. It's just a bunch of bull. Because my Bible says both riches and honor come from you. And you reign over all. And your hand is power and might. And in your hand, it is to make great, not to pull down low. Does your Bible say that? Your hand is to make great and to give strength to all. We got this perverted view of God that God wants to keep us broke down, busted, and disgusted. And it is not God. God wants you to really get into him and then you realize the wealth of this world has nothing to offer you in comparison to a moment of the presence of God. Let me tell you, it's the truth. In fact, go with me to Job 26, if you like, in verse number 12. Listen to how powerful God is. Job's making this statement in verse 26, uh, verse, uh, chapter 26, verse number 12. He stirs up the seas with his power. And by his understanding, he breaks up the storm. Wow, what a powerful God we have. I like what it says in Psalm 62, verse 11. In fact, go there. I want you to read this for yourself. In fact, let's just pop it up on the over. God has spoken once, twice. I've heard this. The power belongs to God. Verse 12. Watch this, verse 12 in Psalm 62. Also you, O Lord belongs mercy for you render the word render to watch this watch this watch this the word render means to give for you render to each one according to his work now wait a minute if God gives to each one according to his work and you don't do any work but you're expecting God to give to you your work is to believe him your work is to put him in there make him first Your work is to worship him and praise him. Your work is to hear his letter. But if you don't know it, you'll put the letter on the wall and end up in poverty. Is anybody listening? Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. For you give to each one according, isn't that what the Bible says in Galatians? What you sow, you reap. How about... Everything they put their hand to, they'll prosper. But if they don't put their hand to anything, this is a God that renders, gives to us. It's powerful. Go with me to Romans. Let's take a look at Romans, the 16th chapter. Verse number 25, and it says these words. Pop it up on the overhead. Now to him, speaking of God, who is able to establish you according to his word, his love letter, uh, by the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation and the ministry, keep secret since the world began. He is able to establish you. To him who is able. He didn't say you establish yourself. He establishes you. He powers you. He gives you and renders to you all that you need, all the strength you need to have. He gives to you in a mighty way. So here's the three questions tonight. You got to come to a place or this isn't going to work for you. Number one, who is with you? It better be God. A God that says like to Mary, nothing's impossible, Mary, with God. Number two, you've got to come to a place of what kind of commitment is it going to take on your part. The commitment that you take on your part is all of your heart and all of your life. It is, without a doubt, everything. And the third, and I love this, question we answer is who backs you? A God that's all-powerful, that controls the oceans, the sea, the sky, controls it all, he backs you. And you've got to keep your heart, and that's the work that you do. According to your work is to keep your heart on him. So tonight, what love letter do you read? What are you believing for? Are you in this place tonight and you're just sitting there staring at me, hoping to get brownie points with God, that life might be a little bit better than it's been? Well, until you get into God, listen to me, 
Until you get into God, he's not going to get into you. And you're going to have to make a way to get into God. And the way is salvation. The way is giving him all of your heart, giving him all of your life, being born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. Now listen to me. If you've made God all of your heart and all of your life, and you've given him all of your heart and life, then is he not responsible? And the only thing that would stop his response to you is you ignoring his response towards you, which makes him unresponsible for you. Is anybody listening? Tonight, before we go anywhere and any further, I just feel led of God right now. There's some of you that haven't yet given God all of your heart. You haven't yet given God all of your life. Hey, you want a better future. You're, you're sick and tired of the past. You're sick and tired of foolishness. You're sick and tired of commitments from people that there's no commitment at all. You're sick and tired of being used. You're sick and tired of failure. You're sick and tired of feeling bad about yourself. And you know what you're really sick and tired of? You're really sick and tired of not having a future that really amounts to anything. And it's time to make the change. And it's time tonight to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life and be born again, headed for heaven and denying your presence. Hell, you cannot get to heaven your way. You cannot get to heaven my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Tonight, if you want a divine future, including on earth as well as in heaven, you're going to have to get out of yourself and the commitment is all of your heart and all of your life. It'll cost you, you. And someone needs to love you enough and respect you enough. You cannot walk on the both sides of the fence with God and expect to be blessed on this earth. It doesn't work. You will make heaven, but you won't get blessed here. The way you get blessed here is you get into this. The way you swim is you got to get in the pool. It doesn't work unless you do it any other way. And tonight I know there's at least 25 of you in here that need to get your coat, get your sweater, get your Bible, get a friend if you need to. And I know you need to get out of your seat and I need you to know that I know you're here. I don't know who you are, but I know you're here. And you need to get out of your seat and in front of everybody, in front of everybody, you get in the aisle and come and meet me right here in front right now. Nobody stand, nobody sing, nobody clap. I just know it whether you respond or don't respond. I know you're here and you need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. You need to be born again, headed for heaven so that you can have a divine destiny in future that God has for you. You are sick and tired. I'm talking to you. You're sick and tired of the way life's going. And you know you need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. You say, well, Pastor... If I stand up and walk that aisle, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, but if you stand up and walk this aisle down here in front, God will see you as serious. Now, do you care more about being embarrassed or that God sees you as serious? Tonight, this is your time. You just get up and you come right now. Come on. Come on, no clapping. You just come. There's one. There's two. There's three. Come on, Dave, you stay seated. You just come and stand right here and face me. There's four, there's five, there's six, there's seven, there's eight. Just come. You're saying to yourself, I'm sick and tired of this. I'm going for God. There's eight wise people already. There's nine. Come on, you don't want to miss this. You've missed too much. It's time for you to go with, for God. Anybody else? You come right now. There's nine. There's ten. There's eleven. You know that's you. You know you need to come and give God all of your heart. You've been living for yourself long enough, and now you need the power of God on the inside of you to help you get through life. There's 11 wise people that are doing that right now. I keep being pulled back to this side. You just, come on, come on, out of the family rooms. Bring your children, it's okay. Sometimes we don't think we can do it. There's 12. 
This is just what God has. The, the Bible says that no man comes to the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This is a work of the Holy Spirit right now in this church, right before your eyes. This is the best work of the Holy Spirit is when people get saved. There's more of you need to come out of this section, and you know it. You need to just stand up. Just tell your neighbor, come on, I'll, I'll go with you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There's twelve. Just that time. It's just time to go for God. Are you coming? Thirteen. Come on. Fourteen. How many did I say? Twenty-five. There's fourteen. Where are you? I don't know if you'll come. Maybe just these will come. Wouldn't that be sad? Wouldn't it be sad if you end up at the end of your life saying, I don't know what the letter said, but it was sent to me. I'm broken down, busted, and filthy, and dirty, and I could have had such a great life, but I felt so uncomfortable getting out of my seat coming. I, I want to have that great life. I want to, I want to read his love letter. How many do I have up here? 14, here's 15. You know you need to come and stop messing around with God. There's 16. There's 17. You know know you need to come and stop messing around with God. You haven't given God all of your heart. You haven't given God all of your life. You know him in your head. Oh, yeah, no doubt about it, but you don't know them in your heart. Check with your neighbor. 17, there's 18, there's 19. Come on, just come on. There's 20. There's five more of you that I know of. That's what God told me tonight. I couldn't get one person to respond. Isn't this funny? Because it's not me, it's God speaking to people to come. Five more of you. Four. Three. Two. There's two more of you. Boy, if you're one of those people, I beg you, don't miss this. Don't miss this move of God. One more of you. One more of you, that's 25. Now, Pastor Dave, come here. Thank you. Pastor Dave, come on, you can come too. <clears throat> Anybody else that just needs to come? There's a 25, but that doesn't mean you can't come. If you feel you need to come, there's a couple more here. There's a couple more there. That's 27, 28, 29. See, you almost thought you are going to miss it, but the grace of God is here to bring you home. There's 30, 31, thank you, 32, 33, God bless you, come on, come on. Don't miss this. God is so good, God is so good. The rest of you are SPTs and that's fine. All of you in front, I want you to introduce you to my friend here. Look over here, look here, look here. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to do that. He's going to give you some free information, some free literature. Now that you're a Christian, what to do next? That's a simple question, is it? Okay, now that I'm saved, now that I've prayed and invited Jesus into my heart, I'm going to go to heaven. What, do I, what does God want from me next? He'll give you a little information free about what to do next. Really cool stuff, easy, okay? Thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a program that we have to help you get strong in Jesus called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You heard about personal trainers? It's a spiritual personal trainer. Here's what we do. We give away friends. That's what we do around here. And that's what a personal trainer is. Someone will call you. Someone will pray with you. Meet you before church service so you don't go to church by yourself. Buy you coffee, tea, nachos. Talk about some scripture with you. Help you to get strong. So you, Why? 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 So you don't go back doing the same old junk you used to do. 
It's because the world is out there, wants to suck you down the toilet, and we're going to help fight for your soul so you keep going forward with God, because guess what? There's a divine future waiting for you in every aspect of life, every aspect, every marriage, children, future, destiny, business, finances, every aspect, God wants to bless you. But until you chase after him with all of your heart, it ain't going to happen. So let us help you get into the rhythm of chasing after God. Is that okay? Make a left turn, follow Pastor Dave right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't God good? Come on now, give the Lord a great big praise.